Welcome, dear viewers, to the MA English channel. That's right, we're kicking off an exciting series all about exploring captivating books and novels, and guess what our first literary companion is? The one and only Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Now, you might be wondering, why Greg Hefley and his hilarious misadventures? Well, buckle up, because we have four awesome reasons. 1. Fun for all, whether you're a seasoned bookworm or a hesitant reader, Diary of a Wimpy Kid will grab your attention and keep you turning pages. It's the perfect blend of relatable humor and engaging storytelling, guaranteed to leave you chuckling and wanting more. 2. English Made Easy, this book is like a language learning goldmine in disguise. The accessible writing style and everyday situations make it an ideal tool to practice reading and understanding English in a natural way. 3. Bridging the Gap, Age and Cultural Differences Diary of a Wimpy Kid throws them out the window. This timeless tale resonates with readers of all ages and backgrounds, offering relatable situations and hilarious antics that anyone can appreciate. For Mirror, Mirror, get ready to see yourself, or maybe your little brother, reflected in Greg's experiences. From embarrassing family moments to schoolyard squabbles, Diary of a Wimpy Kid captures the universal awkwardness and humor of growing up that we all know too well. This series will be a weekly endeavor, with a new video dropping every week. So, if you're eager for the next installment, be sure to join us at the same time next week. But that's not all, we won't be stopping here. Our regular content will continue throughout the week, offering a diverse range of ways to master the English language together. Before we dive into this literary adventure, a quick reminder, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon to stay updated. We also want to hear from you. Share your thoughts about the book in the comments, and let us know your recommendations for future readings. Now, without further ado, let's begin our journey into the Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Hello everyone, and welcome to this introduction to the book, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, by Jeff Kinney. Diary of a Wimpy Kid is a series of children's books that follows the adventures of Greg Hefley, a middle school student who is trying to survive the perils of growing up. The series is written in a humorous and relatable style, and it has been praised for its accurate portrayal of the middle school experience. Jeff Kinney is the author of Diary of a Wimpy Kid and the creator of the popular webcomic Igdoof. He is a former teacher and animator, and he lives in Massachusetts with his wife and two children. The main characters in Diary of a Wimpy Kid are Gregafly, the protagonist of the series. Greg is a lazy self, absorbed, and slightly clumsy boy who is trying to fit in at school and make friends. Roderick Hefley, Greg's older brother, Roderick is a popular and rebellious teenager who loves to torment his younger brother. Roly Jefferson, Greg's best friend, Roly is a kind and gentle boy who is always willing to help Greg out. Diary of a Wimpy Kid is a funny and heartwarming series that will appeal to readers of all ages. It is a must-read for anyone who has ever experienced the joys and challenges of growing up. September Tuesday First of all, let me get something straight. This is a journal, not a diary. I know what it says on the cover, but when mom bought it, I specifically told her to get one without the diary a label. The last thing I need is some jerk catching me with this and getting the wrong idea. Secondly, this was mom's idea, not mine. If she thinks I'm going to write down my feelings or some dear diary nonsense. I'm not about that. The only reason I agreed to do this is because I figure later on, when I'm rich and famous, 
I'll have better things to do than answer people's stupid questions all day. So, this book is gonna come in handy. Speaking of fame, it's coming soon. For now, though, I'm stuck in middle school with a bunch of morons. Let me just say, for the record, that middle school is the dumbest idea ever invented. You've got these preteens mixed in with these overgrown gorillas, and then they wonder why bullying is such a big problem. If it were up to me, grades would be based on height, not age. But then again, that would mean kids like Shurag Gupta would still be in first grade. Today's the first day of school. We're waiting for the teacher to finish the seating chart, so I figured I'd write in this book to pass the time. By the way, here's some first day advice. Be careful where you sit. Pick the wrong spot and the teacher might stick you there for the whole year. In this class, I'm stuck with Chris Hosey in front and Lionel James in back. Not ideal. Jason Brill came in late and almost sat next to me, but I managed to stop that disaster. Popularity-wise, I'm somewhere around 52nd or 53rd this year. Good news is, I'm about to move up one spot because Charlie Davies is getting braces next week. My friend Rowley, bless his heart, doesn't quite understand the intricacies of middle school popularity, but that's okay. Wednesday was phys edition. First thing I did was check the basketball court for the infamous cheese. Sure enough, it was still there, sitting there like a moldy monument to last spring's lunches. The cheese touch, basically the cooties on steroids, started because of that thing. I spent the rest of the year paranoid, fingers taped together to stay crossed. Got A.D. in handwriting, but it was worth it. Nobody wants the cheese touch. Thursday. Still adjusting to the whole of school thing. Summer wasn't exactly a dream start, thanks to my older brother Roderick. He woke me up in the middle of the night, convinced I'd slept through the entire summer. Dressed in his school clothes, alarm clock set ahead, curtains drawn, he went all out. I might have been a bit sleep-deprived, but come on, I'm not that dumb. After Roderick woke me up, I just got dressed and went downstairs to make myself some breakfast like I do every morning on a school day. But I guess I must have made a pretty big racket because the next thing I knew, Dad was downstairs yelling at me for eating Cheerios at three o'clock in the morning. It took me a minute to figure out what the heck was going on. After I did, I told Dad that Roderick had played a trick on me, and he was the one that should be getting yelled at. Dad walked down to the basement to chew Roderick out, and I tagged along. I couldn't wait to see Roderick get what was coming to him. But Roderick covered up his tracks pretty good. He looked like he was sound asleep, and to this day, I'm sure Dad thinks I've got a screw loose or something. Friday at school, we got assigned to reading groups. They don't come right out and tell you if you're in the gifted group or the easy group, but you can figure it out right away by looking at the covers of the books they hand out. Einstein as a child or says boo. I was pretty disappointed to find out I got put in the gifted group because that just means a lot of extra work. When they did the screening at the end of last year, I did my best to make sure I got put in the easy group this year by acting stupid. Mom is real tight with our principal, so I'll bet she stepped in and made sure I got put in the gifted group again. Mom is always saying I'm a smart kid but that I just don't apply myself. But if there's one thing I learned from Roderick, it's to set people's expectations real low so you end up surprising them by practically doing nothing at all. 
Actually, I'm kind of glad my plan to get put in the easy group didn't work. I saw a couple of the says boo kids holding their books upside down, and I don't think they were joking. Well, the first week of school is finally over, so today I slept in. Most kids wake up early on Saturday to watch cartoons or whatever, but not me. The only reason I get out of bed at all on weekends is because eventually, I can't stand the taste of my own breath anymore. Unfortunately, Dad wakes up at 6 o'clock in the morning no matter what day of the week it is, and he's not real considerate of the fact that I'm trying to enjoy my Saturday like a normal person. I didn't have anything to do today, so I just headed up to Rowley's house. Rowley is technically my best friend, but that is definitely subject to change. I've been avoiding Rowley since the first day of school when he did something that really annoyed me. We were getting our stuff from our lockers at the end of the day, and Rowley came up to me and said, Wanna come over to my house and play? I have told Rowley at least a billion times that now that we're in middle school, you're supposed to say hang out, not play. But no matter how many noogies I give him, he always forgets the next time. I've been trying to be a lot more careful about my image ever since I got to middle school, but having Rowley around is definitely not helping. I met Rowley a few years ago when he moved into my neighborhood. His mom bought him this book called How to Make Friends in New Places, and he came to my house trying all these dumb gimmicks like knock-knock jokes. It went kind of like this. Rowley, knock-knock. Me, who's there? Rowley, Thermos. Me, Thermos who? Rowley, Thermos excuse me, there must be some way to tickle your funny bone. Me say what? I guess I kind of felt sorry for Rowley, and I decided to take him under my wing. It's been great having him around, mostly because I get to use all the tricks Roderick pulls on me on him. Monday, you know how I said I play all sorts of pranks on Rowley? Well, I have a little brother named Manny, and I could never get away with pulling any of that stuff on him. Mom and Dad protect Manny like he's a prince or something, and he never gets in trouble, even if he really deserves it. Yesterday, Manny drew a self-portrait on my bedroom door in permanent marker. I thought Mom and Dad were really going to let him have it, but as usual, I was wrong. But the thing that bugs me the most about Manny is the nickname he has for me. When he was a baby, he couldn't pronounce brother, so he started calling me bub, and he still calls me that now, even though I keep trying to get mom and dad to make him stop. Luckily, none of my friends have found out yet, but believe me, I have had some really close calls. Mom makes me help Manny get ready for school in the morning. After I make Manny's breakfast, he carries his cereal bowl into the family room and sits on his plastic potty. And when it's time for him to go to daycare. Tuesday I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I am super good at video games. I'll bet I could beat anyone in my grade head-to-head. -head. Unfortunately, Dad does not exactly appreciate my skills. He's always getting on me about going out and doing something active. So tonight, after dinner, when Dad started hassling me about going outside, I tried to explain how with video games, you can play sports like football and soccer, and you don't even get all hot and sweaty. But as usual, Dad didn't see my logic. Dad is a pretty smart guy in general, but when it comes to common sense, sometimes I wonder about him. I'm sure Dad would dismantle my game system if he could figure out how to do it, but luckily, the people who make these things make them parent-proof. 
Every time Dad kicks me out of the house to do something sporty, I just go up to Rowley's and play my video games there. Unfortunately, the only games I can play at Rowley's are car racing games and stuff like that because whenever I bring a game up to Rowley's house, his dad looks it up on some parent's website. And if my game has any kind of fighting or violence in it, he won't let us play. I'm getting a little sick of playing Formula One racing with Rowley because he's not a serious gamer like me. All that you have to do to beat Rowley is the name of your car something ridiculous at the beginning of the game. And then when you pass Rowley's car, he just falls to pieces. Anyway, after I got done mopping the floor with Rowley today, I headed home. I ran through the neighbor's sprinkler a couple of times to make it look like I was all sweaty. And that seemed to do the trick for Dad. But my trick kind of backfired because as soon as mom saw me, she made me go upstairs and take a shower. Wednesday I guess dad must have been pretty happy with himself for making me go outside yesterday because he did it again today. It's getting really annoying to have to go up to Rowley's every time I want to play a video game. There's this weird kid, honestly, who lives halfway between my house and Rowley's. And frankly, he's always hanging out in his front yard, so it's pretty hard to avoid him. Honestly is in my phys ed class at school, and he has this whole made-up language. Like when he needs to go to the bathroom, he says, juice, juice us. Kids have pretty much figured fragility out by now, but I don't think the teachers have really caught on yet. They keep bringing him juice. Today, I probably would have gone up to Rowley's on my own anyway because my brother Roderick and his band were practicing down in the basement. Roderick's band is really awful, and I can't stand being home when they're having rehearsals. His band is called Gloated Diaper, only it's spelled L-O-D-D-D-I-P-R on Roderick's van. You might think he spelled it that way to make it look cooler, but I bet if you told Roderick how Loaded Diaper is really spelled, it would be news to him. Dad was against the idea of Roderick starting a band, but Mom was all for it. She's the one who bought Roderick his first drum set. I think mom has this idea that we're all going to learn to play instruments and then become one of those family bands like you see on TV. Dad really hates heavy metal, and that's the kind of music Roderick and his band play. I don't think mom really cares what Roderick plays or listens to because to her, all music is the same. In fact, earlier today, Roderick was listening to one of his CDs in the family room and mom came in and started dancing. That really bugged Roderick, so he drove off to the store and came back 15 minutes later with some headphones. And that pretty much took care of the problem. Thursday, parental advisory? More like battery-less advisory. Yesterday, Roderick scored a new heavy metal CD with that enticing parental advisory sticker. This morning, after Roderick left for school, I called Rowley and hatched a plan. He'd bring a CD player. I'd snag the CD from Roderick's room, personal music players were school contraband, and during lunchtime recess, we'd rock out in some secluded corner. Easy, right? Wrong. Rowley forgot Battery's classic Rowley. So, while our musical rebellion fizzled out like a deflated balloon, I came up with a brilliant backup game, Headphones Shake Off. The goal? Yank those suckers off your head without using your hands, fastest time wins. I crushed it with a record 7.5 seconds, though I might have shaken some fillings loose in the process. Just as we were crowning the headphone shake champion, Mrs. Craig rounded the corner, 
catching us red-handed. The confiscated CD player was the least of our worries. She launched into a full-blown sermon about the evils of rock and roll and its brain-melting potential. I wanted to explain the battery-less situation, but she wasn't in the mood for interruptions. So, I played the obedient student, dropping a yes, ma'am, when the opportunity arose. But then, just as freedom seemed within reach, Rowley blurted out something about not wanting rock and roll to ruin his precious brain cells. Honestly, sometimes that kid. Friday, grounded by the sounds of silence. Last night, after everyone was asleep, I descended to the family room, Roderick's CD, and his fancy new headphones, my forbidden companions. Cranking the volume to nuclear levels, I hit play. Now, I understand why that parental advisory sticker was there. But before I could even process the sonic assault, reality intervened. I hadn't plugged the headphones into the stereo, so the music was blasting through the speakers for the whole house to enjoy. Dad's booming footsteps were my cue. Up the stairs I went, the door slamming shut behind me. Let you and me have a talk, friend, he said, that ominous friend is signaling serious trouble. The first time he pulled that friend a routine, I naively thought he was being friendly. Big mistake. Now I know better. For ten glorious minutes, Dad unleashed the fury of his parental disappointment. Then, thankfully, he decided his bed was more appealing than my room. Two weeks of video game exile, predictable, but not the worst outcome. The good thing about Dad is that his anger burns fast. Mess up while he's reading the paper? Recipe for disaster. Laying bricks? You might survive. Mom, on the other hand, takes a more strategic approach. If you cross her, she takes a few days to concoct the perfect punishment, leaving you in agonizing limbo. Then, just when you think you've gotten away with it, BM. The hammer falls. A week without video games? Child's play compared to mom's slow burn torture. Monday, the long, long haul. This video game ban is proving tougher than I anticipated. My thumbs twitch, my brain craves the sweet digital dopamine hit. I've resorted to staring at the ceiling, counting cracks in the plaster, anything to distract myself from the gaping void in my life that was once filled by pixelated adventures. Wednesday, I'm still grounded from video games, thanks to Manny. Mom bought him a bunch of educational video games, and watching him play is pure torture. The good news is, I finally figured out how to sneak some of my games past Rowley's dad. I just stick a disc in Manny's, discovering the alphabet case, and bingo. Thursday, school announced student government elections. Honestly, I never cared about it, but then I realized being treasurer could change things. Nobody ever runs for it, everyone wants president or vice president. So, signing up tomorrow practically guarantees the job. Friday, okay, things got tricky. This kid Marty Porter is running for treasurer too, and he's a math whiz. Maybe this won't be so easy after all. I told Dad about running, and he got super excited. Turns out, he won student government back in his day. He even dug up his old campaign poster, which was pretty cool. So, Dad and I hit the store for poster supplies, and I spent the entire night crafting my campaign masterpiece. Monday, brought my posters to school, and they turned out great. 
One showed Marty carrying a money bag with a hole, captioned, Don't let Marty drop your dough. Another said to remember second grade and Marty's head lice? Do you really want him touching your cash? I started hanging them, but Vice Principal Roy spotted them in three minutes flat. He said fabrications about other candidates were forbidden, and even though the head lice thing was true, practically shut down the school, he took down all my posters. Meanwhile, Marty Porter was bribing his way into votes with lollipops. Guess my political career is officially over. October Monday, finally October. Only 30 days till Halloween, my ultimate favorite holiday. Mom says I'm too old for trick-or-treating now, but Dad loves Halloween in his own way. He hides in the bushes with a giant water bucket, soaking any teenagers who dare to walk by our driveway. He doesn't quite get that a candy a part of Halloween, but hey, it's his fun. Tonight was Crossland High's haunted house opening night, and I convinced Mom to take me and Rowley. He, of course, showed up in last year's Halloween costume despite my instructions to wear normal clothes. I let it slide, though. I wasn't going to let Rowley ruin my long-awaited haunted house experience. Roderick had hyped it up for years, and I was hyped. Once inside, it was non-stop scares, vampires, headless ghouls, the whole shebang. But the worst part was definitely Chainsaw Alley. This huge guy in a hockey mask chased us with a real chainsaw, Roderick assured me it was rubber, but I wasn't taking any chances. Mom stepped in and told him to cut it out, and he mumbled an apology. She even made him show us the exit. It was a little embarrassing, but I'll let it slide this time. The haunted house was cool, but even cooler was Mom saving the day. Saturday The Crossland haunted house really got me thinking. Those guys were charging five bucks a pop, and the line stretched halfway around the school. I decided to make a haunted house of my own. Actually, I had to bring Rowley in on the deal because Mom wouldn't let me convert our first floor into a full-out haunted mansion. I knew Rowley's dad wouldn't be crazy about the idea either, so we decided to build the haunted house in his basement and just not mention it to his parents. Me and Rowley spent most of the day coming up with an awesome plan for our haunted house. Here was our final plan. A hall of screams. A lake of blood. A bottomless pit. A rat tunnel. A maze of one thousand skulls. A knife alley. A severed hand hall. And lastly, a death slide into an acid lake. I don't mean to brag or anything, but what we came up with was way better than the Crossland High School haunted house. We realized we were gonna need to get the word out that we were doing this thing, so we got some paper and made up a bunch of flyers. Haunted house with live sharks. I'll admit, maybe we stretched the truth a little in our advertisement, but we had to make sure people actually showed up. By the time we finished putting the flyers up around the neighborhood and got back to Rowley's basement, it was already 2.30 and we hadn't even started putting the actual haunted house together yet. So we had to cut some corners from our original plan. When 3 o'clock rolled around, we looked outside to see if anyone had showed up and sure enough, there were about twenty neighborhood kids waiting in line outside Rowley's basement. Now, I know our flyer said admission was fifty cents, but I could see that we had a chance to make a killing here. So I told the kids that admission was two bucks and the fifty cent thing was just a typo. The first kid to cough up his two bucks was Shane Snella. 
He paid his money, and we let him inside, and me and Rowley took our positions in the Hall of Screams. The Hall of Screams was basically a bed with me and Rowley on either side of it. I guess maybe we made the Hall of Screams a little too scary because halfway through, Shane curled up in a ball underneath the bed. We tried to get him to crawl out from under there, but he wouldn't budge. I started thinking about all the money we were losing with this kid clogging up the Hall of Screams, and I knew we had to get him out of there quick. Eventually, Rowley's dad came downstairs. At first, I was happy to see him because I thought he could help us drag Shane out from under the bed and get our haunted house cranking again. But Rowley's dad wasn't really in a helpful mood. Rowley's dad wanted to know what we were doing and why Shane Snella was curled up under the bed. We told him that the basement was a haunted house and that Shane Snella actually paid for us to do this to him. But Rowley's dad didn't believe us. I admit that if you looked around, it didn't really look like a haunted house. All we had time to put together was the Hall of Screams and the Lake of Blood, which was just Rowley's old baby pool with half a bottle of ketchup in it. I tried to show Rowley's dad our original plan to prove that we really were running a legitimate operation, but he still didn't seem convinced. And to make a long story short, that was the end of our haunted house. The good news is, since Rowley's dad didn't believe us, he didn't make us refund Shane's money. So at least we cleared two bucks today.